Friends, I am happy to welcome you to my channel. Before listening to the story, I'd like to ask you to like and subscribe. It may not be difficult for you, but for me, it is a pleasure. I'm Brian, Rector at the time of the beginning of this story. I had been married to Melissa Rector and a Zachary for 23 years. We have three adults, or almost adult children, sons aged 21 and 19, and a brilliant 17-year-old daughter who was a freshman at Stanford at the beginning of this story. This is a story about how to contrast soft bodies with hard ones. Although I gained a little weight about 12 years ago, in the early years of our marriage, I made a deliberate effort to lose weight and generally become healthier. Over the past 11 years, I have weighed only 1 to 2 kilograms more than when I played football at a Division III school and weighed 110 kilograms despite the fact that I had a sedentary job, my weight loss and improved health were achieved mainly due to the fact that I exercised 5 days a week for 2 hours a day, but I also monitored my sugary intake. I realized this much later when catastrophic events occurred in our marriage. Melissa did not take my new diet very well. I found out that her first reaction to my weight loss and improved health was outraged. She obviously took my insistence as a backhand, she thought something like, don't you like me the way I am? She even said it several times, which confused me a lot because I never asked her to change and told her weekly that she was beautiful. So, the bottom line is that she resented the fact that I was in good shape, and it made her insecure. Later, I found out when it was too late that Melissa's irrational worldview was like this, I was angry that Brian couldn't understand that the healthier he tried to be, the more I doubted myself. I projected my insecurities onto him, but that self-awareness hadn't come to me yet when I started having an affair, although Melissa's own unfavorable comparison of her physical form to mine seemed to bother her, I believe what bothered her most was comparing herself to three of our mutual friends. Katie, Bernice, and Nicole are three friends who are a year or two older than Melissa, are in great physical shape. They never bragged or posted, it's just that physical shape is important to them by nature, and they have strong bodies. They are also smart and attractive. Katie and Bernice have a happy marriage, but two years ago, Nicole caught her stupid husband cheating and divorced him so quickly that he thought he was hit by a train. I helped Nicole during her divorce proceedings. In addition to helping her contact one of the best divorce lawyers in Minneapolis, I lent her $20,000, which she returned within 18 months without interest, to keep her business afloat when the divorce briefly under finances. I also helped her move into a small house. I stated that her divorce was inevitable and offered to testify on her behalf if her case went to trial, which never happened. I also expressed my sympathy for her situation, including in our house when Melissa was present, and a couple of times at lunch. Obviously, Melissa was outraged that I was trying my best to be nice to Nicole when she was going through a divorce, even though Nicole was at least outwardly as much Melissa's friend as mine. Despite the disastrous outcome of Nicole's marriage due to her husband's affair, Melissa apparently even more stupidly believed that having her own affair was the solution to her problem. Melissa had been acting strangely since Nicole got divorced, but there was nothing dramatic about it. Our ordinary life had become neither more frequent nor less satisfying, although for the previous 17 years, roughly since our daughter was born, I have been more interested in making love than Melissa. The way I found out about Melissa's affair was so corny that I'm almost ashamed to talk about it. I was on the proverbial trip out of town, but it was by car, not by plane or train. My meeting place was about 250 kilometers from home, there was a bit of ice and snow around, so I was a little worried about how long it would take. Before leaving my meeting, I checked the road conditions and found that there was a traffic jam on the interstate highway for more than an hour, and some snow began to fall. I called Melissa to tell her I wouldn't be home for at least four hours, maybe longer, so she wouldn't keep me late with dinner. She seemed a little distracted during our conversation, but in the end, she said, be careful and take your time. When I picked up my car from the valet and tipped him, he asked where I was going. When I answered, he said, if I were you, I'd take Highway 29 and get on the interstate after exit 86. According to the latest information I've heard, there's a traffic jam on the interstate from exit 133 to exit 86, and the situation is only getting worse. If you take Highway 29 to Highway 16 West, you will reduce the time by at least an hour or even two. I took out my card, even though he was a parking attendant, he was able to read it and showed me the way. I gave him another $10 tip and moved on. 
Following the valet's instructions, I got home faster than I expected. As soon as I got on the interstate, traffic was less intense than usual due to the traffic jam in front of exit 86. Besides, there were no policemen around. The snowfall stopped while I was driving along Highway 29, and I could drive at 120 km per hour. When I got to my house, at least an hour and a half earlier than I expected, the notorious stranger's car appeared in the driveway. Only it wasn't someone else's car, and since our driveway skirted the house, it couldn't be seen from the street. The car belonged to Fred Thompson, the head librarian of the municipal library where Melissa worked as a volunteer. Fred is a hypocritical, toad-like, flabby, soft-bodied bastard in his forties. I never liked him. I didn't understand how Melissa could be sexually attracted to him, and yet I couldn't think of any reason why he would be in our house while I was gone unless it had something to do with making love to I parked my car in the driveway that skirted an empty house for sale on the other side of the street and walked to our house. I need to describe our house a little bit. This is an old house that could be called a mini-mansion if it were built nowadays. I didn't like the house, but Melissa liked it. Firstly, now that the children were gone, it was too big for two. In addition, it required constant repair and maintenance. In fact, we had just repainted all the wooden floors, and there was still something left to do. For example, install new carpets on the long main staircase. The ceilings on the second floor reach 4M in height. There is an entrance door at the back of the house, and a back staircase, which is nowhere near as aesthetically pleasing as the main staircase at the front of the house. I took off my shoes as soon as I entered through the back door and crept up the back stairs. Melissa and Fred were in the guest bedroom. Most of what they were saying was unintelligible, but I heard Melissa say something like, the king of training will be here in about an hour and a half, so I'll have plenty of time to get myself cleaned up. I assumed that I was the king of training, although I had never ever called myself that, at least not like that, and it was clear from her tone that she considered training either stupid or impolite. An idea came to my mind, if the hallway and stairwell were not lit, it would be dangerous to go down the main staircase, and an accident could happen. I quickly went down the back stairs to the utility room and turned the two main switches to the opposition. Then I quickly climbed the back stairs, shining my flashlight on myself until I got to the top, then turned off the flashlight and crawled to the edge of the main staircase. It was pitch dark in the house. I couldn't even see my hand raised to my face. Melissa and Fred seemed very worried, and I heard Melissa say, be careful going down the steep stairs, Fred. I'll do that, he grumbled as he slowly headed for the stairs. I reached out my hand, and when the toe of his right shoe touched my palm, I pulled it forward. The screams when he hit the step for the first and second time were such that his blood ran cold. When he struck for the third and fourth time, there was no sound, only thuds downstairs. He fell silent. Melissa started screaming, when Melissa began to carefully descend the stairs, I crawled to the back door, used the flashlight again to get down safely, put on my shoes, wiped the handles of the switches with a rag, and, using a rag, moved them to the on position. I wiped the door, the back door handle, and sneaked back to my car. Then I drove into a Starbucks, which was about 3 kilometers from my house and on the way to the interstate highway. I parked on a side street for about an hour and then drove into the Starbucks parking lot from the side, in which I would have been driving if I had been driving from the interstate highway. I got in line and bought two chocolate brownies with double chocolate, ostensibly one for myself and the other for Melissa, and drove home. When I got home, Melissa wasn't there, but there was a dark red spot at the bottom of the stairs, on one step, about halfway up. Smaller spots and a few red splashes on the wall near this step. I smiled. I went up the main stairs, trying not to step on the bloodstains, and saw that Melissa had not changed the sheets on the bed in the guest room. I think she was panicking because of Fred's fall. I rolled up the sheets, put them in a large plastic bag, and hid them in the utility room. I put a Starbucks paper bag with two brownies and a receipt with a time and date stamp on the kitchen table, and then called Melissa on her cell phone. She answered after the fourth ring, but cautiously. I got right to the point, where are you, Melissa, and what are those dark red spots on the stairs and landing? I just got home, and it looks like a disaster zone. Well, she stammered, I probably asked too much at once. Melissa, let's start by telling me where you are. 
Well, i.e. at the Memorial Hospital. Fred Thompson, you know, the head librarian. Well, we were talking about something, and he fell down the stairs. Shimon, what the hell was Fred Thompson doing on the second floor of our house? I shouted. Oh, well, she faltered again, what will I find when I go upstairs? I shouted again. There is no reason to go upstairs. I'll be home soon, she immediately replied, with alarm in her voice. It's too late, was my only response before I interrupted the call. I packed some of my clothes and other things that I really needed, took the bag with sheets from the guest bedroom, and a paper bag with cakes and a receipt, and drove to the hotel. Melissa called me on my cell phone when she got home. Brian, where are you? What is it? She asked plaintively. At the hotel. I'm meeting with a divorce lawyer tomorrow, I barked, and then I interrupted the call and turned off my cell phone. Using the phone from my hotel room, I called the divorce lawyer whom Nicole had recommended and who was also my friend. I asked how she was doing, and after a couple of minutes of small talk, I asked if I could meet her at the office the next day to use her services. I'm sorry you need me, she said, and then we made an appointment for the afternoon. A day later, the police came to my office. Mr. Rector, we are investigating the concussion, lacerations, and broken bones that Mr. Thompson received at your home a couple of days ago, and because of which he is still in the hospital, I thought Fred's fall down the stairs was an accident, I replied casually. Well, maybe it was, but Mr. Thompson seems to think that someone may have grabbed his leg, and the house mysteriously went dark, and then lit up again. The utility company claims that nothing happened at that time. Really? I replied. So, to clarify, all our data, where were you at that time, and that was about an hour and a half before you called your wife at the hospital, so where were you around 7.30? I was driving home from a meeting that took place 250 kilometers from here, and I ran into an annoying traffic jam for more than an hour on the interstate highway. I left around 4.30, got to the Starbucks on Maple Street between the freeway and my house around 8.30 to 8.45, and bought a couple of chocolate brownies with double chocolate for myself and Melissa, and then returned home and found dark red spots and puddles everywhere. Do you have any proof of where you've been? Well, here in my office, I have a parking ticket with arrival and departure timestamps for travel expenses, and in my hotel room, I think I still have a receipt from Starbucks, and a paper bag where there is one cake left, since I never gave it back to his wife after he found out about her infidelity. As for traffic, you can call the state police. I gave them a photocopy of my valley ticket and actually went with him to my hotel room, gave them a receipt from Starbucks, and told them to check the security cameras. Then I told them, this is all I have, and I won't give interviews anymore. If you need anything else, you can contact my lawyer. I gave them one of my lawyer's cards. In return to the office, I haven't heard anything more about them. It didn't take long for my marriage to end. My lawyer got a court order to get DNA samples from Melissa and Fred, and when their DNA was found in liquid on the sheets in the guest bedroom, I had an irrefutably strong position in the divorce process. Many of my friends and distant relatives called to express their condolences, but depending on the friend, I either feigned sadness, humility, or moderate joy. In fact, only one friend, Nicole, had a moderately joyful expression on her face point two weeks after my final divorce from Melissa, I set off on a trip from Minneapolis to the west of America. I had to leave, in my imagination, I went through all the scenarios and emotions related to revenge. Melissa, my revenge on Fred was more than enough, reconciliation, separation, unsolicited advice, depression, anger, hatred, regret, call it whatever you want. Now it's time to clear your head. Unlike most 45-year-olds who have been married for 23 years, I at least had the advantage of not having money problems. I worked hard, creating a company that produces unique vertical axis wind turbines that I co-invented. When I first learned about my wife's infidelity, I quickly accepted the most profitable of several open sales offers that I had received from large multinational corporations over the past two years. The offer I accepted was the best for my employees and the second most profitable for me. The monetary difference between it and the best offer is insignificant, you can spend so much money only in your whole life, especially valuable to me were the unique circumstances that allowed me not to share any income from the sale of my company with my ex-wife, 
even though she received half of everything else we owned and kept the house by buying out my share. It was enough to make her feel quite comfortable but not as obscenely rich as me. 17 years ago, before I could get a loan to set up my own wind turbine company, the insurer insisted that my wife give up all her rights because the insurer could not risk a change of management. For this, Melissa was paid $200,000, which she transferred to an account to which I signed all my rights at that time. She was very happy with the money because she did not believe in the success of my business. She wasn't so happy when she found out how much I earned from selling the company, Hot at MY 21-year-old and 19-year-old sons, one of whom was in college at the time of filing for divorce and the other was in his second year, agreed with my decision when the fact became known. My 17-year-old brilliant Stanford freshman at the time of filing for divorce, an advanced payment was made for her education, but a very emotional daughter was furious that I did not want to reconcile. She told me that my wife, her mom, had lost her way because she had poor self-esteem and she no longer felt attractive, so she was just trying to get at least some positive reinforcement. And now she worries and regrets as if it was a magic wand that could make everything disappear. It didn't help me one bit. However, there was probably something in the argument about low self-esteem for the reasons that I discussed earlier. However, it was not something that I could forgive, regardless of the reason, after a two-week trip with stops at various national parks and monuments, usually for two or three nights, I drove my Tesla Model X to Peach Springs, Arizona, near the Grand Canyon. After two fun days spent there, I decided to go hiking with a guide and spend the night at the bottom of the canyon. The leader of the hike was about a 50-year-old guy named Rex, who looked like you'd imagine a Highlander. The other tourists were a married couple in their 40s from England, two college students from Montana, two sisters, Monica and Elizabeth, who were about 30 years old, and Bethany, Monica's 17-year-old daughter. Later, I found out that Monica was 39 years old and Elizabeth was 36. It was a friendly group, and we really got to know each other pretty well from the moment we started at 8 o'clock a.m. until we were ready to go to bed in our sleeping bags around 10 p. M. It was early autumn, and the temperature was warm but not unbearably hot. No one was particularly hot, except Monica and Elizabeth, the sisters, frankly speaking, were the embodiment of erotic dreams. Monica was married, but her husband had work responsibilities, and he was supposed to meet them at Zion National Park in a few days. Elizabeth recently got divorced. Bethany was a pretty teenager, but she was the only one in the group who seemed withdrawn, and it seemed to me that one of the reasons for this trip with her mother and aunt was the desire to let her relax a little. As it turned out, I was sitting between Monica and Elizabeth while we had dinner and drank the bourbon I'd brought with me, and I made a splash with all the campers, even Rex, by telling two ghost stories, the vanishing hitchhiker and the witch from the bell. Then Rex took the initiative and told the story of the Bloody Mary ghost, which I was also familiar with, especially with the ending. I could tell that Bethany was thrilled with all three stories and was sitting on the edge of her chair, stoned when Rex came to an end. As soon as he got to the scariest part, I crept up behind Bethany, grabbed her by the shoulders, and shouted, Bloody Mary is here. I think Bethany set the world record in the sitting long jump and the 20m run when she screamed and ran. When she heard the laughter, she turned around, horrified at first, but when I shouted, gotcha, she rushed after me. Monica and Elizabeth joined the chase, and I let them catch me and pour sand on my shirt when I tried to look as awkward as possible. Everyone laughed heartily, and Bethany stuck her tongue out at me, as if to say, gotcha. To be honest, it was a little difficult for me to fall asleep that night, and not at all because of the small amount of sand stuck to my back. It was hard to fall asleep because I was thinking about Elizabeth. I didn't mind at all when she held me on the ground while Bethany sprinkled sand on my shirt. Elizabeth is a strong girl who reminded me a lot of Nicole, only taller. I finally fell asleep when I heard a scream. It sounded like Bethany's scream when I put my hands on her shoulders at the end of the Bloody Mary ghost story. I instantly jumped out of my sleeping bag about 30m away from me, I saw something that looked like a big cat. I immediately ran up, since I was without shoes, picked up a stone on the way, and hit it hard in the ribs of someone who turned out to be a medium-sized mountain lioness on Bethany's back. The cat growled and then ran away. I immediately went up to Bethany, hugged her, and told her she was safe now. She was crying hysterically in my arms. 
Of course, by that time, the whole camp had already woken up. Monica and Elizabeth came up to Bethany and hugged her too. When Bethany calmed down, she told us that she got up to pee, and when she came back, something jumped on her back. Bethany had a lot of scratches, but thanks to the fact that she quickly assumed the fetal position, and I was able to get there in a matter of seconds, she was not badly hurt. Rex treated her cuts and scratches with his first aid kit. In the next day, we took her, at least for a tetanus shot. When Bethany returned to her sleeping bag, she insisted on putting it next to mine and touching it. Monica, Elizabeth, and I were very attentive to Bethany during our return the next day. In fact, I insisted on carrying her backpack instead of her. I talked to Bethany, keeping my eyes on Monica's and Elizabeth's, but most of the way back, and she seemed really relaxed. She was interested in a career in renewable energy, and since it was my specialty, she was happy to provide me with all the information available. That evening, I treated Bethany, Monica, and Elizabeth to dinner. We had a great time. Around 10 o'clock, Bethany began to feel sleepy, and Monica went with her to their room. I noticed Monica and Elizabeth's sly look when Monica and Bethany were leaving, and I wish that look was what I had hoped for. After Elizabeth and I had a drink, believe it or not, we didn't need any other alcohol. She started to really flirt. In the end, Elizabeth got impudent. Right in the middle of talking about something completely different, she poked me in the chest and said, you know, Monica thinks you need a reward, not only for saving Bethany but also for making her feel free. Really? I laughed. What kind of reward? Well, since she's married, she can't give it to you, but since I'm divorced, I have an unpleasant duty to provide for it, she said seductively, with a devilish grin on her face. I don't want to hurt you, I smiled back. Do you have any prints in your room that we need to look at? she asked with an even more devilish grin, running her finger over my chest. I signed the check, and two minutes later, we were naked in my room. Hell no, I muttered back, trying to stick my tongue in her mouth, and then continued, and you take birth control pills, right? After another struggle with her tongue, she whimpered, I just had my last Depoprovera injection a week ago. With that, I picked her up and laid her on my huge bed. I would never refuse a lady's request. When we finally came to our senses, we were dizzy. Wow, you know exactly how to make love, I said with a smile, kissing her nose and lips. If my husband could make love like you, we'd probably still be married, she retorted, showering kisses on my nose and lips. I think we passed out rather than fell asleep, but we woke up in the middle of the night, at about the same time. I fell asleep with a smile on my face, enjoying my heart. The next morning, when Elizabeth and I stumbled into the dining room, she was wearing the same clothes as last night. Monica and Bethany were sitting at the table and waiting for us with big smiles on their faces. Bethany was ruthless in her jokes, snarky remarks, and taunts, although it was all done playfully and indicated that she was actually relaxing. Monica just grinned. When Bethany and Elizabeth went to the bathroom, Monica pulled her chair up to mine. I'd give you your reward if I wasn't married, Brian, she chuckled, taking a bite of the sausage. After I made sure I blushed and pulled on my pants, she took a bite of the sausage, she continued, I'm sure Elizabeth did a great job, but since you're a good guy, I'm warning you about what I guessed. Elizabeth got divorced because she cheated, and I don't think she's capable of changing, but next week, she will give you the best pleasure of your life, just don't fall in love with her. Monica whispered in my ear, then a smile appeared on her face. She returned her chair to its original place, and by the time Elizabeth and Bethany returned, she and I were already talking about politics. I was very grateful to Monica for warning me because Elizabeth was attractive enough for me to fall in love with her. The next day, Bethany and Monica went to meet their father and husband in Zion, respectively, and Elizabeth accepted my invitation to travel with me for the remaining six days of her vacation. It also made me think about the future. I dropped Elizabeth off at the Los Angeles airport. I paid for her flight home because she didn't have a return ticket from there, and everything else when we were together, including buying her a $2,000 jade necklace and matching earrings, which she oohed and odd about during one of our stops. I said goodbye to her with a passionate kiss but without promising further contact, although she seemed to be waiting for it. 
Since the time spent with her was the embodiment of my dream, I'm sure that even without Monica's warning, I would have promised to meet again. But no matter how passionate Elizabeth was, I could not go down the path of infidelity again, even though I avoided falling in love with Elizabeth. After I dropped her off at the Los Angeles airport, I felt like, as I drove north towards Palo Alto, that's the problem when you live out fantasies for a short period of time, an accident can change your life. It took me two days of leisurely travel to get rid of my ailment. Then I came up with a good idea, another one inspired by Elizabeth, came to life. The first idea was to contact my daughter Alexandra, who is now a sophomore at Stanford, and resume our relationship. She wasn't very friendly during her phone conversation, but when I promised to take her and her two friends to a fancy dinner and a play, she beamed. Alexander's two friends were smart and sophisticated beyond their years, like Alexander herself, and I tried my best to charm them. I think I managed to charm them, at least in part, because they invited me to tailgate the next day before the football match, and Alexandra didn't veto it. I took advantage of their offer, met at least a couple of male students at the board engage, who seemed to show interest in Alexandra, and bought tickets for Alexandra and one of her male friends to go to the game with me. Instead of sitting in the student hall, Alexandra and I had dinner together and had a frank conversation. When I left Stanford late on Saturday night, Alexandra seemed to understand my situation related to the divorce from her cheating mother much better. In all, the differences between Alexandra and me were resolved. The second idea that came to my mind required me to really prove myself. At the time I left Minneapolis, I wasn't seriously thinking about going on dates again, but my date with Elizabeth and the accompanying increase in my self-confidence changed that. When I was going through my divorce, I subconsciously always thought of someone who could eventually be found, and the time I spent with Elizabeth brought this out of my subconscious into consciousness. I knew that a relationship with her could cause problems, but at that moment, I didn't give a damn about it, in fact, since a relationship with her would most likely have angered Melissa, it would have given me the opportunity to get back at Melissa, which I needed so much. The woman who came to my mind was the only woman I ever desired while I was married to Melissa, although I never under any circumstances reacted to it. Nicole, a smart, personable, divorced woman, my age, who looked like a model, answered after the second ring when I called her on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock, Minneapolis time. After a brief exchange of information about the well-being of the interlocutor, I got down to business. Nicole, I have a reason to call for more than just to talk. I wonder if you would like to watch the performance of Dear Evan Hansen and Mean Girls with me. I didn't know they were going to Minneapolis, she replied. No, they're playing in San Francisco, and I'm there right now, I replied after a pause, Nicole asked, you're serious, aren't you? I've never been so serious before. I'll transfer the money to you for a first-class ticket and leave the return request open, I said cheerfully. Do you expect me to just drop everything? What is it, she asked, but without being. I don't expect you to do anything, Nicole. I just hope you'll join me. I have a queue for theater tickets, and I would really like your company. You probably don't know, but I've always loved you very, very much. Oh, I knew that, she laughed, but I've always respected you for not giving into that feeling while you were married. I swallowed visibly, fortunately, she couldn't see me blushing. So, I'm going to have to stay the night. What is it, she asked, with a note in her voice. Yes, probably for three or four nights. I'll get you a hotel room, I promise, I said shyly after a pause, she blurted it out in response, would that be fun? Just make sure that there is a large double bed in our room in case you move a lot in your sleep. I'm sure she had a devilish grin on her face when she said that. While we were talking, I was checking my schedule and the flight schedule of the plane. I can arrive by 7 on Tuesday evening, she said. However, don't schedule a performance for Tuesday night. We'll need this time to get to know each other better. Nicole is not a goddess, but she is as passionate as any normal woman can be. She has an incredibly pleasant, elastic little body and a sky-high libido, as well as a strong but really cheerful character. After two nights, when we tried every betting action and pose we could think of, combined with my knowledge of her character and personality, as I had known her for over ten years, I was in love. Five days after I met Nicole at the airport, she and I were on our way to Portland, Oregon. 
Since I have to check in four days, maybe you should try to get some little blue pills because before that, I intend to use you to death, and I want you to die with a smile on your face, my only answer was, what was me? Let's move on to another topic.